today's program is really dedicated to hearing the voices of our young people. A lot of times we talk about violence in the city and it's um, a bunch of adults. And so today we're going to hear specifically and, and uh, in a very pointed kind of way from a group of young people who have had some experiences, some interaction with violence, either as a victim, as a perpetrator, as just a, a bystander. But um, we know we are living in very difficult times right now and this is one of the most important conversations that we can be having on a Saturday afternoon. So I commend you for making the space and time in your schedules to being here today. So thank you very much for that. I want to thank our uh, partners and our sponsors. This program is done in collaboration with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is the, the number one children's hospital in the country, I do believe. Um, and they are very much committed to uh, violence as a public health issue and youth violence and bullying and aggression as a very, very important health issue. And so we're not here today just to talk, but we're also here to understand, to listen and to engage and to help uh, CHOP begin to evolve and develop a program that will be effective around addressing this issue of youth violence and uh, bullying and aggression. So I want to thank CHOP for uh, partnering with us to do this important conversation. I also want to thank our other sponsors for the program, Universal Companies, Always Best Care, Comcast, and um, we're very happy to be doing this in partnership with the Black History and Culture Showcase, which is everything that's surrounding us today. So a big thanks to, to all of them. I do want to make a, a note that in your program book, you're going to see a, a, a little note card and so I want everyone to find that note card because when we get to the question and answer part of the program, we're going to ask you to write down your question or, or over the course of the dialogue, if, if a question comes to you, we want you to write it down on this card and we will come and collect those uh, cards as, uh, as we enter the portion of the program where we're going to do the Q&A and we will ask those questions. The, um, the name and the region of the city, the age and your contact information is all optional. It's all optional, but we thought it would uh, allow us to have a little bit more of a, a personal touch. And we wanted contact information really because this is the beginning of the conversation, okay? We are a talk radio station. We have the opportunity to continue to have these kinds of dialogues ongoing. So we wanna make sure we capture information and, and we have the ability to reach back out to you if we want to interview you or if we want you to participate in other ways around this issue of, of youth violence. So um, right now I want to invite um, Peter Groman from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to um, greet you. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much. We're uh, very pleased to be partnering uh, on this event uh, today with WURD, so we appreciate the uh, partnership. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Wow, all right. Well, thank you all for coming out. And to um, restate what uh, Sarah said, we are here uh, to listen. And we're here to listen to a very important voice, and that is the voice of youth. We are a children's hospital, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, is the nation's, nation's oldest children's hospital, and we have a number of primary care locations throughout the city of Philadelphia, including our main hospital in West Philadelphia. But um, um, in, in an effort, and uh, our commitment to children, in an effort to really improve the lives of children, to save lives, to create healthier opportunities for children in our community, in our city, uh, this issue, the issue of violence, is one that is very important to us. Um, not only was CHOP as an organization troubled uh, by the mass tragedy that we saw at Sandy Hook Elementary School, but we are very familiar uh, with uh, the tragedies that we see uh, here in our own community on a, uh, on a more regular basis. And so to that end, uh, CHOP has sought to meet the needs of children and families for as long as our existence, and that's something that we're doing on this very important issue. 
So if you think about a child who has uh, uh, had uh, is a victim of a of a shooting, that child will come to CHOP to have an important need be met, and that is to to save a life. But what we are doing as part of our violence prevention initiative is that we are. Uh, providing important services. I like to call it a concierge level type services to children and their families so that they can go back into their community, get reintegrated into their community, get the support services that they need so they don't come back to CHOP. That's our goal. We also want to work with children and their families who may have been affected by other types of violence. And when they come to our primary care centers, receive uh, a comprehensive sort of services, uh, assortment of services uh, that, um, you know, that will uh, hopefully uh, prevent uh, uh, traumatic activity in the future. Again, this is very important by way of prevention. And so the last piece of what we're doing at CHOP that we're very excited about uh, is working uh, in our schools. We have a number of initiatives which empower youth to actually train one another on how to prevent aggression and how to, to, uh, and, and to, how to build leadership skills and other types of things that are really important uh, to help one another uh, live a, a more peaceful life or coexistence in the school. And the last piece of that is that uh, this spring, or it is spring already, I would say in May, uh, next month, we're going to be launching a new multimedia experience that we're going to uh, pilot in two schools in Philadelphia uh, to help address this issue. And our hope and our intention is to spread it to even more schools. And so um, these are things that, that, that the hospital is doing, but we can't do them alone. We have to do them in collaboration to make them work. So that means with the youth and with the families. But um, our work is only as good as the voices that inform them. And so to that end, we're very excited uh, about today's uh, discussion uh, and to again hear these important voices uh, to, uh, to uh, make this work possible. So again, thank you uh, for taking the time to come out today. And we look forward to a very uh, exciting discussion. So before I bring up our moderator, Brother Shamari, uh, also known as Eric Grimes, who you may hear on Word periodically in the mornings, um, I did want to just kind of go over what to expect, the run of show for today. So we will um, begin our conversation with our, our youth panel with a, um, a video introduction of the, the panelists. So that'll be in just a moment. And then we will have five wonderful panelists who will share their perspectives, guided by Eric Grimes um, as, a, as our moderator. And then we're going to bring up uh, some stakeholders, some, some individuals who work in this space around youth violence. Um, and they're going to further engage with the, the young people. And then we'll open it up to the audience with uh, Q&A. And we'll close things out with some final remarks by the um, Secretary of Corrections, John Wetzel. He's the Secretary of Corrections for the state of Pennsylvania. So um, we're very excited to um, have a, a very full and, and focused afternoon. So again, make sure you're writing down your questions as we go along. But right now, I want to introduce our moderator, Eric Grimes. Um, also known as, I know you don't really like that, also known as Brother Shamari. Um, Eric is an activist, author, I should have worn my glasses, author, speaker, and educator whose focus has been developing consciousness, raising, and transformative learning experiences for individuals, families, organizations, and communities struggling to overcome social marginalization, poverty, and systemic racism. He's the co-founder of ACT. Um, concepts and ACT stands for Action, Advocacy, Knowledge, and Training for Social Justice and Community Development, an ACT signature initiative reaching out for the brothers, um, concepts, ideas, strategies for the exemplary development of black men and boys, engages in action, advocacy, knowledge, development, and training to authentically and accurately articulate black male experiences in an effort to empower young black men and boys, as well as those who work with or on behalf of them. 
So um, I'd like everyone to welcome Eric Grimes. Um, all, one little note is uh, we are broadcasting live, so just wanted to uh, let you all know that, uh, that this conversation is being heard far beyond the walls of this uh, auditorium. So uh, with that said, I welcome Brother Shamari Eric Grimes. Welcome. Good afternoon, family. As a little week, how y'all doing? Good afternoon. So what I'm going to ask in the spirit of family, I have a simple question. I want you to raise your hand, yell, shout, whatever. How many people love our children? Raise your hand if you love our children. All right, so officially, I want to welcome you to the, I'm renaming this right now, the We Love Our Children Town Hall. Right, so our, our young people might be impacted by violence, they might be impacted by a lot of things, but we're here because we love our children and we're gonna talk from that space. This is the We Love Our Children, Our Youth, Our People Town Hall. Welcome to you all. So what I would like to do is as our panelists are coming up and assuming their positions, I'd also like if, if people want to have a more comfortable experience, a more village filling experience, I'm just gonna ask that you move up. It's not a demand, it's a slight request, but if in the spirit of village building, we can kind of move up and become a little more close and a little more bonded as we have this conversation, that would be greatly appreciated as our panelists come up to the stage. Panelists. So by way of housekeeping, also, uh, Sarah mentioned about writing your questions on the card. If you see, there should be some, some people who work at the station who are walking around with these lovely gray WRD uh, radio station t-shirts. Feel free to hand your questions to them. Also, for the more technologically savvy, we're taking questions at uh, pound on word, if you want to tweet your question. Um, I think it's, I'm, I'm not technologically savvy, so I'm saying pound on word. That might mean something else in the tech world, but is that one over there? Okay. See, there y'all go. Okay, so thank, thank, you for, thank you for the lesson. <laughs> so as moderator, what I'm going to do is set a framework, and then I'm going to be quiet. I'm just going to ask questions, and we're going to hear from our young people. One of the things that was real important, and we've had this conversation, is about I believe that listening is one of the highest forms of love. Right, because you can't fake listening. You can fake hearing, you can fake talking, you can fake a lot of things, but you cannot fake listening. It's one of the highest forms of human connection possible. And one of the things we're here to do today is listen. Listen to one another, listen to a lot of things, but primarily to listen to our young people. The other thing that you must bring into this conversation as we move to solutions is a spirit of empathy. And empathy requires you to, number one, listen and understand that even though I might not agree, I can feel into the space where they may have been operating from. You have to allow yourself to feel into the space. And so those are the only two guidelines as we enter our conversation today. So again, questions, write them on the card or hashtag on word. Um, and again, listening and a spirit of empathy. So again, I want to welcome you all to the We Love Our Youth Town Hall. We're focusing particularly today on the issue of violence as it relates to how it's impacting and affecting our young people. So I want to give you all and yourselves a hand for being here, and we're about to get started. So what we're going to do is have our panelists introduce themselves. We're going to start with Brother Rashid, who's going to tell you about himself real quickly, and then we'll have a video um, summary of the other panelists that we have on stage. So Brother Rashid. How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? Good evening. My name is Rashid Smith. I'm from uh, Philadelphia Ceasefire Temple University. I'm an outreach worker. I work with high-risk youth between the ages of 14 and 25. And that's it. Oh, yeah, and I'm an artist against violence. Yeah, right, and, and no, we're going to introduce the rest of you all through video, and I was told that all I have to do is hit play. We're going to see if this works. What's going on? I'm Chill Moody. I'm a hip-hop artist from West Philadelphia. It's definitely completely different. Like, you'd be watching that clock like, oh, I got to fight after school. But you knew we had to fight at the most. You might get bold on because he had a squad. Not, I might get shot after school, and now it's, I might get shot in school. It's definitely got gotten a whole lot worse. I blame a lot on the media and how they sensationalize murder capital and 
things like that because a lot of kids are really impressionable so they hear these things and take pride in it you know some rappers are stupid enough to rap about you know we from the murder capital not like we don't want to be from there or whatever but like as a badge almost a badge of honor and i think that's ludicrous My name is DeVore Irby. I'll stand on my head. Maybe we were cautious about my surroundings. I would not trust a lot of people. I'm not proud to say that I was a bully before, but I was. I bullied because I didn't want to be bullied, and I didn't want to have that disadvantage of like people saying, like, I'm a punk, or I can't fight or something. So they kind of like wanted me to bully other people before I can be bullied. I grew up in a home with my mother, who was a single parent. You know, she did the best to raise me and my sisters. I had a holiday father. He only came around on holidays and birthdays and things, things of that nature. My mother was doing drugs. My mother did drugs, and that angered me. I having my father around, I took to the streets, and it wasn't a good thing. It led me to being locked up. Could have lost my life a few times. Could have took people's lives and it just wasn't a good thing. So, one of the things I want to do in the spirit of uh, bringing some humanity to this conversation, I want each of you, we're going to start here with Chill, to tell us briefly who you are outside of the violent incident that was highlighted in the video. Who are you? you want me to start? We're going to start right here. With Chill. Um, well, as you may have heard, I don't know how the volume was. I'm Chill Moody. I'm a hip hop artist from West Philadelphia. And um, you know, who I am outside of that is someone that is very prideful in my city. I'm very prideful to, you know, carry a badge that I'm from Philly when I go to other places. And, you know, I'm very prideful to see people come out here that actually care about these these situations and are willing to, you know, take that step into making a change, like myself. from Southwest Philadelphia. I'm very artistic. I like drawing, coloring. I'm not really into violence or anything. I'm homeschooled. That's about it. I'm my own. I'm your Move it closer. Move it closer to you. I'm Earl. Um, I'm your typical working guy, everyday working person. I'm a father. And, you know, I'm just trying to be here to get my story to help someone else. That's it. And um, I told y'all my name was Rashid, but in the streets I go by She Lo. I'm an R&B artist. I'm from South Philadelphia, but I reside down in North Philly. I'm a young father of two. I'm 21 years of age, and I'm proud to see everybody that from Philadelphia care about the community as much as I do. All right. Welcome. So one of the things I'm going to start, uh, She Lo, was, the, was that the name? All right, we're going to start with that. What I want you to do is think about the, the incidents of violence that you may have been affiliated with in some way. Um, I want to know, in that moment, what are you thinking? What's in your head? Who's in your head? And why do you decide to listen to, to whatever thoughts that are, that are going on there? What's, what's going on in the See, brain? Like, uh, for me, I always was a listener. I never was a follower. I never follow nobody or oh, I'm gonna do this because this person did it. Whatever I did, I did it because I wanted to do it. I was raised by my mom too. My mom wasn't a drug addict, but my mom was a drug dealer and so was my father. So I picked up their actions and started doing the same thing when my father left. So the thoughts that was in my head was, I'm gonna do what they do. So it really wasn't about like listening, it's just what I seen. So like a lot of kids, like they go by what they see, not what they hear. Like so if, for instance, like a child see Somebody smoking weed, they think it's cool because they see the person that they looked up to doing it. Okay. So it's like a peer pressure thing at the same time as like being a follower too. Give me an idea of one of the messages your mom or pop might be saying that would make you say violence is okay in this moment. Well, they wouldn't say violence is okay, but they would say go get a dollar. Okay. All right. That's cool. what they used to do. Like mommy and daddy got to feed the kids. And when my dad went away, I guess it was my turn to step up. Because I'm taking care of nine kids still to this day. 
All right, appreciate that. Earl. Well, what, same question? Yeah, same question. Well, you know, coming up, I looked at the streets as a, as a tool. I looked at the streets as a tool to get my name out there. You know, coming up, I didn't have no positive male role models in my life. You know, you look at the community, you got the cops, they become police officers and move out. Then you look at the firemen, same thing. The doctors, they become what they, well, they um, achieve a certain level of success and then lead the community. Leaving me with going to school every day, seeing people on the corner selling drugs, and you know they got the new Jordans on, they got the good jewelry, the latest cars, so that's who I looked up to. You know, and it wasn't a good thing, but that was my choice. Right. Sister Dee Dee. Um, I guess I would say I'm different from everybody up here. Speak into the mic a little bit. I guess I'm different from everybody up here because I wasn't into the streets or violence or anything like that. I just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time for me to have something happen to me. So in that situation, though, you know, some people would say, hey, you should retaliate. You should do this, that, or the other. What are the, what are the things, the thoughts in your head? What are the people who you listen to saying to you that either would cause you to retaliate or make you make a decision not to? Um, I wouldn't retaliate because I, I guess, like, I do stuff for my brothers, and I know they look up on look up to me, so I don't want to set a bad example of like going out and doing something that I would regret, because then it probably have them thinking like, oh, I can do this, and I don't want them to think that. Right. Um, I just think like I was lucky enough to have you know, aside from my parents, I had those old heads in the hood who may have you know, been involved in the streets, it may have been involved in things, but they knew that wasn't me. So they told me, you know, go get your education, you're smart, go do that, go, you wanna be a rapper, go follow your rap stuff, don't, don't come up here, we about to be shooting, or don't come up here, we about to be doing this. So I was lucky enough to have them and to, to instill that in me to want to go on and pass that to my nephews, pass that to my, my little cousins or whatever, that, you know, you have friends that do those things, this is where we're from, we grew up in the hood, but be smarter to rise above that. And like he said, some people, you know, become successful and leave the hood. If you're gonna leave, make sure you come back and bring some things back. So it was always a, a duty, or I wanted to be a duty of mine to make sure I come back and continue to give back if I do decide to leave, but also in hopes to make it where people don't have to leave to right. make it. Okay. So to be the first one to try to like make it here and make you know that you don't necessarily have to leave to make it. So, so, so a lot of the conversations that we have is either young people don't know any better or they know better and just choose to do differently. So in a moment, like any situation that you're thinking of that has to do with violence or aggression, do you know what you should do and do you do that or do you know what you should do and say, but yeah, this moment right now says, I know that, but later for that, I gotta do something different. What, what's that play there when you're making the decisions about whether that? But real fast and easy, listen. A lot of young guys is traumatized. They don't have no positive role models, they don't have no guidance, and there's not enough men out here. So, with that being said, a lot of young guys gotta be men at a young age, and they gotta stand up for what they know. See, like, I ain't had no old heads telling me or in my ear, like, I learned from experience and watching other people do things. So, like, I seen that, like, I'm, I'm, I, like, I ain't gonna talk your head up, but I had went to jail at a young age. I was in and out of jail since 12 years old for selling drugs and shooting, and so forth and so on. So like, when I seen that my friends or none of the people that I'm doing all this stuff for wasn't there, it made me look at things differently. So I look at life different. Like I'm very talented, I'm funny, I can sing, I can dance, I can play ball, I'm a young father. I got little brothers who look up to me, so it made me want to change. So with my change, I want to change others. So I try to change the normal other kids' behavior. I don't care how old you is, you're never too old to listen to somebody. So I listen and then I tell them how I feel about it and you know, they go about it on doing what they want to do. All right, all right, buddy. Appreciate that. Yeah, I feel like it's all situational. Like, you know how he said, I didn't have the old heads 
tell me those things. I learned from experience. But it's what you do with that situation. Like he took that experience and you know what he learned from his mistakes or whatever. Some people like myself learned from watching other people make mistakes and saying, I don't want to end up where they are. It's, it's about finding the way to reach each of these groups of people that learn in different ways in different situations and putting things together like this where you have people from all different walks of life that are able to tell their stories and express, you know, so now you can connect with at least somebody, whatever, however your story is going, you might connect with somebody different. All right. Well, I didn't learn, like, I was one of the hard-headed children coming up, you know, <laughs> and I didn't think stuff stink till I actually stepped in it. Therefore, I went out there, and, you know, I got my beak wet, and I did whatever I had to do because I didn't want to be the punk. I didn't want to be the one everybody like, oh, he's a coward, he ain't riding, things like that. But once again, I didn't have nobody positive telling me, well, look, young brother, you're going to get killed. You're going to be locked up. I didn't have no one telling me that. Therefore, I went out there and did what I did, and I learned from it. So as time went on, you know, I kind of changed because I was looking at people getting killed around me, you know. I got twin daughters and everything like that. So it's like, I want to be around for them. I want to be around for my family. I want to be around for the people that love me. And you know, I think the major, the most change that, well, the most, the changing point in my life was when I left. Sometimes you got to separate yourself away from everything or you won't be able to learn. I don't think that, like, the, the influence was too strong for me. So, you know, I was kind of just in it. That's it. Uh, well, all of y'all are speaking from male perspectives. <laughs> so I guess I'll speak for females. I say females, like, females is doing the same thing as y'all doing. But the reason why they're doing it, I would say, as my perspective, is because they're trying to be like y'all. Mm. Because the saying, Girls can do anything a guy can do. So y'all out there shooting and stuff, so it's like, why shouldn't they? Why can't I have that top publicity that a guy has? Just because I'm a female doesn't mean that I can't get respects on the street or anything. Wow. Can I just piggyback off of what you said? Can I just like say one thing? To uh, uh, real quick, real quick, go ahead. Like, the females, it's up to y'all though. Like, if y'all show men, like, like that y'all don't want no guy that's doing the, the dumb things that they doing, maybe they're wising up. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you want to respond or let that marinate, <laughs> Sister DD. You want to, anything or just let that sit? I want to know about the, because I hear this thing about respect, right? How big is the issue of respect not being a punk, not being seen as, as low man or a sucker, low woman? How big is that in the moment when you're making a decision about whether to engage in violence or something. Let's, let's start down here with chill and just work our way down. Oh, wait. Can, you, um, can you repeat that? Yeah, just, I heard a lot about respect, not wanting to be seen as a punk, not wanting to be seen as a low person, and that's you know, both in male and female situations. How big is that? How big an issue is that for real, for real, when, when the moment comes and you gotta decide whether to hit somebody, shoot somebody, stab somebody, or not? Uh, it's way more of a part than it should be. I think a lot of how people react is based on how their reputation is going to look afterwards. So um, I think it's too, it's too big of a part. Sometimes, you know, a lot of us, you know, whether it's a violent situation or whatever, we, um, we suffer from being too prideful at times and not being able to swallow our pride and, you know, turn other cheek and, you know, understand, you know, me, is a reaction, this action is gonna have a reaction and it's gonna, it might be adverse every time. So um, I think it's a little, people sometimes focus a little too much on, you know, having that reputation and, you know, street cred and those type of things. Um, the respect issue, I guess it depends on a person because the way like I would show respect is like not responding mm. and I know maybe not responding, that would probably like downgrade me more, but I know at the end of the day, like I just respected myself. Like I don't need respect from nobody else as long as I'm respecting myself. 
Yeah, that was good. That was good what you said. <laughs> I, I'm feeling that because I respect myself a lot now. But at the time, being in the streets, respect was a big thing. It was definitely big. I'm not going to let anyone take anything from me. You know, I'm not going to let anyone do anything to me. Because if I let you take something from me, he's going to think he's going to be able to do the same thing. You know? So that's where I'm going with that. Respect is big. And um, like Moody said, your pride definitely gets in the way of that. But it's a lot of people in the graveyard right now with pride. A lot of pride. <laughs> See, with me, I ain't really too much worrying about no respect. I ain't got no pride. I didn't care what nobody think about me. I'm going to be Rashid, because that's who God made me to be, Rashid. So, like, for somebody saying, like, like people respect me out in the street for what I used to do. So, like, if I turn my back on somebody that want to fight me or got a gun towards me or saying this and that and the third, it's not going to make me a nut because they know what I used to do and what I can do. And I know what I'm capable of, so I'm not worrying about what the next man or the next female think about what me doing. You can call me a punk, a, a faggy, a nut. I'm going to be that punk and that fag and a nut. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be living. So, so it sounds like, though, if you got self-respect, then that whole issue of needing somebody else's respect, you can kind of deal with a little more sensitive. I flag them all. <laughs> all right. You got it. It's one of my favorite questions, man. Other people might not appreciate it. But I'm wondering, I'm going to start in the middle and, and spread out so, so that... Uh, Earl and Dee Dee don't always have to go kind of in the middle. So we're going to start with them. Do y'all think that, you know, because a lot of people have experienced a lot of the similar issues we're talking about. Do you think this issue of violence feels and looks and manifests differently for black youth than other youth and for males versus females? Is it a different thing if you're a young black male versus a, a white female from the suburbs or a white male from, from Mount Airy or whatever the case may be? So we, well, I'm not, I can't really say that it's any different, but I know being a young black male is definitely hard because people look down on you, you know, they speak to you in them condescending tones and sometimes it just send you over the edge, you know, but I'm not in no one else's shoes. I can only speak for right. what I'm doing every day. When you say people, who, who are you talking about? Around your way, when you go to the store, what people are you talking about? If you're at work, you know, when you go in different stores, people look at you like, like they look at me like I'm ready to steal something. I don't got to steal nothing from no one. I work hard for everything I got. You know what I'm saying? And when I go down the street, people just look like they're scared. I don't know if it's the way I dress, the way I talk, the way I carry myself, but I feel like I'm a very respectful young man. Okay. Um. It's okay to clap, it's okay. <laughs> But then again, I do because being a young black female on the streets and stuff, you do look different and you do get downgraded more. People's perspectives of a black female shouldn't be how it is. So it's like you can't, you can't accomplish a lot. It's just like make you want to shine more and like just keep going, even though you keep getting shut down and shut down. Wow. Um, I think there's definitely a difference, and I think the two main differences would be, one, how the media portrays black violence, and also the fact that a lot of black violence is black-on-black -black violence as opposed to others, you know, other races aren't necessarily inflicting violence on themselves. So, yeah, the, the way the media portrays it is really, like, a, a big thing. Of like, I really don't like how they sensationalize a lot of stuff that goes on in our, in our community. And it's, it, you know, it can sound like a little, like it just feels like they're picking on us, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. And you, you feel that way sometimes and you know, you try not to have those burdens and try to look at the facts or whatever, but it's hard to really like, not just feel like, yo, you know what you're doing. Like you're really right. picking on us, like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just gonna piggyback uh, off of what Chill said. Like I feel the same way he feel, but at the same token, like, a lot of people looked at me different. Like, I got two felonies. I'm only 21. Got tattoos on my face, but a lady named, I don't really want to say her name, but I'm going to say it, Marla Davis. She gave me a second chance. Like, got me hired at Temple. So, like, it's, 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 it's crazy because they count you out, like, when you get felonies and they judge you by your third grade test scores. So it's like they set you up for failure, but at the same token, you got to beat them at their own game, and that's what I'm doing mm -hmm. right now. 
right. I'm beating them at their own game. All right, since we're on this a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump further in. How much do you all think, and we'll start right here, um, you know, the radio station I'm affiliated with is called WURD, which, you know, in, in some other language that spells word, right? How big is our words in setting the conditions for violence? How, how do words like nigga and the B word and the stuff that we hear on the media, on the playground, when we go to school, how much about the way we talk to and about each other matters in violence? I just feel like we should shine more light on the positive things. So, you know, the whole, like the whole, um, how we had the, the funeral for the, for the N-word a while ago. I'm, me being a musician, I'm not a really an advocate of like music censorship and things like that. Just me being an artist, I feel like art shouldn't be censored, but I feel like artists should take more responsibility in what they do. So I feel like those type of things should be the things that, you know, all the cameras are out for. And, you know, let's, let's put that on World Star or something like that. Some of the more positive things that are going on. I feel like that will help way more than just having, you know, mad, you know, town hall meetings and things about the negative things. And it's kind of bringing more and more light to the negative. And, you know, it's for a good cause. It's to, you know, eradicate that negative thing. But I just think, once the, where the basis is a positive situation, it should be a lot more on like a bigger platform. Okay. Sister Dee Dee, words. Um, I say like the words that we use nowadays, it like, it make it seem like it's cool to call each other dumb words, whether it's a B word, any type of word really. We make it seem like, oh, it's okay to call us this word forgetting what that word really means and that we're really like downgrading ourselves and calling us like all types of words. All right. Well, I think, I think words are powerful, especially in music, you know? I, I like hip hop music. I listen to hip hop all the time and I think that it definitely sends a very, very violent message. But see, if you're young and you're gonna believe in what they're saying, then that just makes you stupid, you <laughs> wow. know? Smart people could play stupid, but stupid people can't play smart. And I think that <laughs> the rappers, <laughs> the rappers, the, like, when they do the music that they're making, they know the difference in what they're saying. And I think words are very powerful. A lot of people say actions speak louder than words, but words hurt. And if a person say something to me that makes me feel a certain way, that separates boy from the men and the girls from the women because I'm going to walk away because I don't want to get in trouble. You know, I don't want to hurt nobody. I don't want to be hurt. Therefore, I would just walk away. And that's all I got to say about words. All right, powerful. <laughs> well, like you said, like, well, as far as artists, like, some, like, y'all young, young ladies and young men in here, like, a lot of them artists, they got high school diplomas and they went to college and they got mothers and fathers. It's just like they putting on the act. So with that being said, like the words that they're using, like a lot of these young people using those type of words, it's a learned behavior. Cause you gotta look at the household that they coming from. So when you hearing these such things, like we're not even gonna talk about the music because ain't no Meek Mills here. We got, we got Chill Moody, we got Earl, and we got Didi and Rashid. So we gonna talk about these youth. So it's like a learned behavior for them. Like when they hear one of their aunts or one of their uncles say the certain words, they, they, they come up using it and they think it's cute. So I'm gonna tell you like, I would tell anybody else, I don't want no ratchet female or I don't want to hang around no young boy talking about he going to do this or suck this or do this or do that, this, this, that, and the third because that shouldn't even be in their vocabulary. If they watch the news, they see that these schools is closing down mm. and education is key and without no education, you can't even work at McDonald's. So like, you can use all them type of words all you want, but it's not going to get you nowhere. All right, all right. We get some wisdom up here. Let's get a wisdom a hand. What we're about to do is um, turn our conversation over to a, to a group of uh, facilitators. I'm going to introduce them and ask them to come up. And then while they're coming up, I'm going to ask you all one closing question. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Joel Fine, who's the director of CHOP's Philadelphia Collaborative Violence Prevention Center. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> She's already been mentioned. 
But Ms. Marla Davis Bellamy, director of Philadelphia Ceasefire, and Drexel University's Dr. Charles Chuck Williams, founding director of the Center for Prevention of School AIDS Violence. So before they take over, I just want to ask the panelists one more question. As we're talking about reaching out to young people in an effort of preventing them from engaging in violence, what do we need to be saying and doing so that they hear us? And what do we need to not be saying and not doing? What do we need to be saying and doing as adults, as a community, as their peers, such that they can hear the message? So uh, I'm gonna say from a man's standpoint of view, like we gotta stand up as men, and men should stand by their word and be a man of your word and lead by example. And we should make memories and try not to make no excuses for everything. All right. Well, well I look at it as we're not going to talk about race or gender. At the end of the day, we all are human beings. So how, how would you feel if someone was to kill your friend or your cousin? All right. People basically need to be their own man and just stand up for what's right and stop falling into the negative. That's all I gotta say. I would say people need to take responsibility onto what they're doing themselves. And instead of like adults lecturing you all the time, like try to see from the youth point of view, not just what y'all seeing, because what y'all seeing is not really what, like, going through our mindsets or anything for the reasons that we do stuff. All right. <laughs> That's why we're here. Um, I would just say we definitely have to embrace and understand our influence on people, whether you're on the highest platform or you, you know, are everyday working person, you're going to influence somebody. You're influencing somebody every step of the way. So understand your influence, and on top of that, Embrace your influence by knowing that you can influence people. So use that influence to teach and you know educate people and you know edify the youth that we have a chance. You know I mean? That's right. Let's give our young people a hand. All right. And now what our facilitators are challenged to do is to tease up some of the messages, some of the dialogue, some of the core themes you heard our young people raise. And then when you all are done, we're going to take questions from the audience. Thank you. Well, I'll go. Yeah. You want to start? Um, what was I going to say? I'm 40, so y'all got to work with me. My memory ain't what it used to be, although I look 13. Here's the thing. Uh, you all talked about making positive choices, being your own man or woman, having self-respect so that when they come at you a certain way, it won't affect you so you'll make a bad decision. Now, the question I have for all of you, and we can start with Sheed. Are you OK if I call you Sheed? Because yeah. uh, I know Sheed. We go way back. He's my junior colleague. Uh, so what if a 15-year-old Sheed from Bartram comes up to you right now and says, what do I do? They want me to do whatever this negative behavior is, like you said. It seems like everybody is doing it, right? They're talking about it in their songs, Rick Ross, everybody else. If everybody is doing wrong, how do I do right? Well, listen, um, it's so easy to do the wrong thing, and it's hard to do the right thing. So I would just take him away from his environment, you know, kind of be there for him, stay in his ear and show him what I've done that got me in trouble doing the wrong thing and showing what got me where I'm at now doing the good thing. And I let him choose, like I let him touch the water. Sometimes you gotta, you know, take, take them little baby steps before you can take, you know, big steps. So like I was showing like step by step where it can get you at doing something wrong. And I was showing step by step where it can get you at doing something good. This where I'm at by doing something good. I'm talking to y'all. I would definitely tell that young man, 
I would, I would just keep it real with him. I would tell him what I wanted someone to tell me when I was out there because uh, I was a perpetrator of the streets. You know, the things that I was doing out there, it was very violent. And I look at it like, I would definitely tell him that if a person would put a gun in your hand or a drug in your hand, that person don't have no love for you. So you need to stay as far away from that person as possible. And also, like you, I'm gonna piggyback off you, she, like disassociate yourself. Get out of that environment. Get out of that environment, that that stumping ground, that safe haven, because it's not good for you. That's the only, that's how I changed. You know, I left. And like ever since I left, I've been, I've been working now. You know, I've been trying to educate myself and learn other things, better my vocabulary and so forth. So definitely, a lot of kids, if you've got someone out there that loves you, that's in a different state or a different place, period, and willing to take you, make that move because if you don't there's only two things out there that's all i gotta say what are the two things death or jail i would tell the 15 year old male that like at the end of the day is it is their choice so like y'all can be telling this person what not to do, what to do, what would happen if you do this, do that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's what they're going to do. So I would tell them to like recognize, to first recognize what they're doing and to think about what they're doing first before they react. But I know I can't change somebody's mindset of what they're going to do, but I would tell them like that's, the first step for them to like come to somebody that they think will help. Um, you, you mentioned like respect and we keep talking about respect. And um, I would just tell that, that, that kid, look at or reevaluate who you're looking for respect from. You, you're coming to me and you're telling me that they're, they're doing bad things or whatever. Why are you, why do you want their approval? Everybody's not doing bad. You know, you came to me, you asked me this question. Understand everybody's not doing bad and you see what's going to be the outcome of what they're doing. At the end of BLU, like you said, it's two choices. And whether it happens tomorrow or it happens 10 years from now, that's what's going to happen with them. You explain that to them and tell them, you know, reevaluate who you're actually looking for respect from, I think. The Philadelphia ceasefire program, we focus on the reduction of homicides and shootings in particular. And here in Philadelphia, according to the Youth Violence uh, Strategic Plan, we've had 5,051 shootings of young people. What do you think we need to do as a city to address that issue? And also talk about the accessibility of guns on our streets. Um. It's a lot of things. It's, not, it's definitely not just one thing we have to do. Um, decrease the accessibility. There's one right there. Um, inform people of just everything that's going on with that. Like, try your best, whether it's, you know, me town hall meetings, whether it's, you know, stop the violence rallies or concerts or, you know, classes or after school programs talking about those type of things. Um, just have that information readily available in different mediums to express to the youth that this is what's going on. Not just the youth, everybody. It's not, you know, it's kids being shot, but it's not necessarily the kids shooting them every time. So you have to express that to everyone. Just have that information out there and try different mediums of getting that information out. All right. What I would say, definitely, we got to stop. Like, we put negativity on a poster board. I'm going to use the Overbrook brawl for an example. They got it on the news as the Overbrook brawl. Now I'm going to put myself as them kids who knocked the security guard out. I would have been in my neighborhood a ghetto superstar for that. Oh yeah, Earl, you knocked the security guard out. Yeah, my man. But then when you look at it, they putting that up there as making people in the streets look like it's good. Why can't they put up there instead of Overbrook Brawl? What can we do to change the way we're teaching these students to make it more fun, you know, to make people want to learn? Because I am a victim of, like, I, I dropped out of high school. 
You know, and I'm trying to still focus on finishing and everything. So why can't we change the message that we're putting even in the media? The media messes our heads up. I dropped out. I dropped out of high school too. I received the GED at Pine Grove State Penitentiary when I was 19. So like, uh, as far as they were saying, like, uh, like how we're targeted, you got, we got to be there as the people. Like we got to come together as community instead of, oh, I ain't from North, I'm not going down there. Oh, I ain't from South Philly, I ain't going down there. Oh, I ain't from West Philly. Like you got to, like, all, everybody got to come together and do it as one. We got to become as one. Like we all human beings, like they said. We got to respect each other and we got to do this for our kids because there's babies out here dying day and day and day. Like seriously, like that 11 year old little boy that just was shot last week, that was a friend of mine's nephew. So it kind of took a toll on me too. So me particularly, man, I'm getting out there and I'm addressing this situation and I'm out there every day on the bullhorn screaming, stop the shooting, save our babies. So we, for, for, what Ms. Marla just said, all I'm saying is we need to come together. That's what I would do. That's one of my solutions. Tell all the communities to come together. 900 AM WURD, Philadelphia. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of really good messages that you guys are sharing with us, but also it sounds like you share with whoever you can. And I guess my question is, you know, how can we as a community, but also we use, if you, if you had an ability to reach thousands, hundreds of thousands of youth, how would you do that? What is the best way that you feel we would be able to do that? And what would you say? We got to reach them at a level to where they understand. But what Basically, would you use? What would you I would, medicine? just what? like he said, we got fun events, give kids something positive to do. We don't got no recreation centers. We don't got nobody running no good positive committee things. Like all we hear is music. All we see is drug dealers. All we see is this. So it's like a learned behavior, like I said before. We have to have more men and we have to have these women stand up and be women and take responsibility of their kids because the kids is running over these women. So you gotta get in there and nip it in the bud. Like I look at I look at everybody like a brother and sister. I remember before I used to like give people the grill when they look at me, but that don't get you nowhere in life. Like, I don't let nobody judge me and I don't judge people because I ain't God. I'm just a young black man trying to make it out of the hood. Like, I hear a lot of young guys say, man, I'm from the hood. And when the key is to make it out of the hood, and then they say they're in a trap and we really is trapped. So what we got to do is get them out of that trap because we got them around guns and the drug and alcohol. Like, if people really care, they would fight to get these recreation centers back open. They would fight to get these kids something positive to do and give them, like motivate them, reward them for something, doing something good. Like I'm looking in the crowd right now, I see one of my participants and he older than me. He told me and it made me cry. Like, cause it's somebody older than me, he look up to me and he turned his life around. He have a job and he taking care of his daughter now because I motivated him just by talking to him and being there for him. So all you gotta do is just be there for that person. Like, even if they calling you three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, just to vent to you, answer that phone and listen, cause that's what matters. Like the little things count. Like you can't worry about what somebody think of you or what, what they gonna feel about you. You gotta be you and stand up for what you know. I wanna piggyback on what she just said just, and can go over to you. We talk a lot about parents in different ways and how they can influence this conversation. A lot of people say that when you talk about making parents accountable or holding them accountable, you're blaming them. So as a young boy, no disrespect because I'm 40, and the rest of y'all, what would you say to parents right now as a young black male, like you just said you were? What would you say to them as it relates to what happened at Overbrook, as it relates to what happened at Bartram and all the other stuff? What would you say to parents right now? I tell them, take a stand. Like, uh, you got to take a stand. Like when my mom, I see my mom falling off because I was raised by my mom. And I take care of my mom and her seven children because she's still going through, she's still traumatized from when my stepfather was murdered in, in 09. So like even when I see my mom falling off and I see my little brothers getting out of hand, I just be like, Umi, listen, I love you, but you got to tighten up before they start running all over you because I ain't going to be here for long. Like real rat, like I'm still growing. Like day and day. I learned from my mistakes, like, and I'm happy to be up here with these, these young brothers and this sister right here, because it's some, it's some good to do. Like, a lot of people might not be listening, they might be going in one ear and out the other, but I'm passionate about this. Like, I'm so passionate about it, 
I don't get no sleep at night. Like, I be up texting Miss Marla, like, listen, there was a shooting in this place, and I'm on it. I'm gonna go put up some posters. I'm gonna go talk to people. Like, at the end of the day, you gotta tighten up. You gotta man up. You no, know, I tell my mom she gotta tighten up. Real rap. You gotta tighten up. You buying them Remy, you buying them the tight jeans, you letting them put these show ins in their heads, and then when they get disrespectful. Right. So can we give a hand to our facilitators and our young people for their answers? Thank you all very much. Now what we're going to do is go into a, a question and answer period. So, so, so let me do a little ground rule now because, uh, so we can hopefully avoid this at the end of the day. There's no way that we're going to get to all of your questions, right? So everybody's clear about that. So what I did was I shuffled the deck. The only one I did not shuffle was the person who gave me the card first. So I gave them an executive privilege. They will get the first question. Everyone else I shuffled and pulled out three or four, depending on how many we can get to. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a commitment that I might get fired for, but what I'm going to commit to, and I'm committing for everybody up on the stage as well, is that we're going to answer, and even if you have questions now, I'm going to ask you to write them down and pass them to the end of your row. What we're going to do is set up a time at the radio station where the young people can come back together and we will go through each and every question on here. We're going to video it, we're going to audio it, and somehow on the station's website, podcast throughout the next month, year, whatever, every question is going to get answered and addressed in some way, okay? We're, we're going to make, am, am I fired? All right, so we're going to make that commitment. Um, because one of the things that's real important is this is not a one and done event. This is a, and I want to give Sarah particularly credit for this. The station is committed to addressing at every level possible this issue. So this was just a beginning. We're going to have many more versions of this conversation, and the station is going to do everything it can do so that we're always talking about what we do on behalf of and to manifest the love that we have for our children. So I just wanted to make that commitment. If your question doesn't get asked today, we will address it. So here we go. And if I mess up the, your handwriting or whatever, just I'm trying to get as close to the question as possible. Oh, I'm sorry. Last but not least, I was asked for each of the panelists to give your email or Twitter handle for people who want to follow up with you and engage with you further. So we're going to start right here. Everybody get your pen and paper out. Mine's is easiest, just what my name is, Chill Moody. You can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or chillmoody.com. Everything is Chill Moody. Chill Moody, M-O-O-D-Y? All right. <laughs> DD? My email address is DD, two E's for both of them, dot all day nine seven at gmail. All right, you're gonna have to do that again. DD, I got that part. <laughs> DD dot all day, nine seven at gmail.com. DD, that's D E D E, all that, nine all seven. All day. All day, okay. <laughs> I was like, hey, self confidence. <laughs> all day, nine seven at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, my email is earlstinson11 at gmail.com. And you can also follow me on Instagram, <laughs> ipyearl23. All right. Say it one more time, somebody say it. IPyEarl23, Instagram, follow me. Well, uh, my number is 215-817-9107. My email is rashidsmith92 at gmail.com. And y'all can also follow me on Instagram at 215-SHEEDLO. 215-S-H-E-E-D-L-O. All right. And again, if you have other questions that you want asked, please pass it down now to this end of the aisle and somebody from the radio station will just come down and start picking up the questions. Again, we commit to answering them. It won't be today, but we'll create the platforms and the formats to address it. So our question, and I'm gonna start here and ask you to work your way down. If you choose to answer, if you choose not to answer, you can always pass. How about a youth peace town hall? As many do not know how to practice in a peaceful way. A youth peace town hall. I'm assuming that would dis discuss strategies about how to bring peace and more peaceful interactions into our lives. Yeah, 
I'm I'm off. I'm for all of that. Um, like I said, it's about attacking it in as many different ways as possible. So if you know, youth peace rally is one of those, then or youth peace town hall is one of those, then I'm all for that one too. Well, um, I'm for it too. Well, I got a little pledge going on every 14 days. I want to live. This is the T-shirt I got on right now. And it's about bringing the communities back together. And myself as an artist, I'm a singer. And I like to, that's how I express my feelings through music, ladies and gentlemen. Like when I'm angry, I write music. So like I got a pledge going on on the 26th, I'll be in South Philly. And then 14 days after that, I'll be up uptown. So I'm with all the peace, peace, power to the people, peace, everything. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm, I'm all for change. You know, that's a, that's a, um, a big problem now out here. A lot of people are definitely afraid of change. And anything to change the community, I'm all for it. All right. Uh, we're gonna start down there. Rashid, where are you with, where are you now with self-control? Do you know what it is and do you require it in your life? Self-control. Right now? <laughs> I don't even wanna sound like a No, right now, um, right now, like, I'm. Very self-controlled, like, because, like I said before, like, you never know who's watching. And a lot of people look up to me, like, and I got a lot of little brothers who, who growing up right now, and I got a son of my own, he's one years old. And he always looking at me, and when I leave, he pull, pull in. So, like, with self-control, I, I, I got it under control. Well, I'm a very patient person, and I have a lot of self-control. That's it. So you see, it, it's, it's an important thing. Yeah, it's definitely right. important, a very important thing for me. You know, I have children, so I gotta be patient. And make right. sure I don't do anything stupid. That's right, good parenting skills. I understand self-control. I have self-control because I, why wouldn't I wanna be controlled over myself? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so, you know, you, you get these questions that you know come from your elders. And we, we got two elder questions coming. I know this. Question number one. What can we do to encourage young males to pull their pants up? <laughs> can I say one thing? Can I say one thing? Please, Dr. Chuck, can I say one thing? I went upstate. All y'all young guys that's wearing your pants hanging off your booties, that's advertising your booties. So you can do that all day if you want to. But you go up there, you're going to be in the boom, boom room. Well, I, I ain't but, 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 but before we go down, because the question was, what can we do? So, so as young Scared people. straight. OK. So your, 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 your response would be to really tell the truth about what it means and where it comes from. Advertising your behind. OK. All right. Pearl? Well, you know, I like to lead by example. Yeah. You know? <laughs> my, my pants fit. And I know I look good, not to be conceited, but yeah, my pants fit. Okay. So, so, my so, pants fit. <laughs> so your answer is, if I may, model the yeah, appropriate behavior. Definitely. And you if the cool it. brothers pull their pants up and model that. Yeah, lead by example. All right. <laughs> yeah, Dee, I, 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 I don't want to skip Dee, Dee. She might have an answer for us, too, about what brothers need to do. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I feel the exact same way as Earl. Definitely lead by example. It's, it's not comfortable for me to wear my pants like sagging, so I've never done it since I was young and you know, that was when it was the style or fashionable and I'm just not into that, so yeah, definitely lead by example. Now I just gonna piggyback on that. All right. Because as someone who teaches college at Drexel, uh, shout out to Drexel, although I was educated at Temple, so shout out to TU as well, right. One of the things I learned, you know, I worked at Penn State, Cheney, and Temple, now I'm at Drexel, you can't always judge a young person by how they're dressed. So for example, I, I was gonna to apologize to Sheed after the program. I have a blog post where I talk about too many tattoos on young boys, right? But what I've seen is I've seen young scholars come into my classroom with their boxers showing. I've seen them come into my classroom with tattoos on. I've seen them come into my class reciting Rick Ross lyrics. So, it's not necessarily, we gotta remember there is a youth culture. Right. And you had it, I had it. Don't forget we were all young once, 
Okay, we but, shouldn't expect all the young boys but, to wear bow ties if they're not is feeling it, o- it. Is it okay for the village, particularly the village elders, to have a line that says this is the standard and I should not have to see who made your draw? Okay, hold on. I'm a, this is a good conversation. If you ask me in the work that I do, dealing with kids that have psychiatric problems, emotional problems, learning problems, some that are far behind, some that are far ahead, remind me of that, right? I'm not fighting that battle. The battle that I want to fight is, can I get you to go to school every day? Can I get you to sit in the classroom and stay engaged? Can I get you to get A's? A's for J's, by the way. Can I get you to plan for the future? Can I get you to think about what it really means to be a young mother or a young father? If I can get you to do those things, I really don't care what you wear. Okay. That's just me. I'm speaking for myself, though. All right, and we we, we got we can have a whole town hall, or hold no, on, we can have a whole town hall on this issue. So what I'm going to do no, right I now, Miss Marla, I'm gonna ask, chime in, okay. and then after no, you, a, that just we, a brief we, comment. And I understand Dr. Chuck's point. However, you know, certainly uh, Rashid and his uh, uh, participant Marquise know that when we're talking about employment and we're talking about job interviews. You're not gonna get a job if in fact you walk into someone's office with their pants hanging down. So therefore, no, no, no I understand, there, there's a time and a place no for shot. everything, okay? Okay, Some, somebody got to tell me with a time and place to walk around with the draw show it is, but I, I'm just old, I guess. All right, last, last question. This is Family Friendly Radio, by the way. And again, you can tell this is a, a question from an elder, even though I think it's relevant that we all should be asking. So this is our close out question. And I'm gonna ask all four of our, our young people to respond. How can we encourage our young people to marry instead of settling to be babies, mamas, and daddies? Anybody could go first. <laughs> well, you should. When you're dealing with somebody, you need to watch their mother or their father. If the, if the guy, I'm gonna talk to the females because y'all need to hear this for real, for real, y'all young ladies. If the guy don't respect his mother, he ain't gonna respect you. You dig what I'm saying? And if he ain't willing to wrap it up <laughs> and tie you down, you already know he ain't good for you. I wanna be with my son mother, but unfortunately that's not gonna happen. So like, when you're dealing with somebody, you might be with them for now, but five years from later, you might even not even be looking at that person way. So what I do is I just stay motivated on what I'm doing. And my good wife, she gonna come to me because I'm gonna be a good husband. I'm not really trying to speak on marriage. I have, I have a young lady here with me today. Psychotist point. <laughs> no, but I, I, I honestly think that young people should definitely get married. Like if you're really gonna be with somebody and you love that person and you feel as though you could possibly spend the rest of your life with that person, then why not marry them, you know? Things happen, you can always get a divorce. I, I'm sure Philadelphia don't have alimony. Second to this plan, but oh, yeah. But you know Earl, they be wanting they keep they cake and they eat it too. Though, at That's the same what I'm saying. Time. You can't but be she, like that. If she gonna be, I don't know. Okay, yeah, Sister Dee Dee. Right now, babies having babies really like, uh. like I, I don't want to get into marriage or nothing. That, like I don't want to think about that right now. I really want to be focused on my career, what I'm going to be doing in five years, not <laughs> a ring on my finger. Um, I just think it's more about making responsible decisions. So you know, whether that's getting married or whether that's you know shacking up with someone. Make a responsible decision if there's a child, if a child involved, mm. and don't bring a child into a, into an irresponsible okay. environment. Okay. So I was told that we had time for two more questions. So hopefully everybody saw me shuffle them up. Well, while you're, while you're shuffling, can I ask one? Can I ask one that is sure. kind of eating at me a little bit because I don't know how to get. Um, I don't know the answer to this, and I'm hoping that you do. For for Chill Earl and Rashid, you both you all decided at some point to make a change. And so you kind of established what I think I'm hearing is a new identity, in a way. And that's fine, because you know what you are. And, and the question I want to know is, how did you let other people know what you are who may want you to be what you used to be? Um, I look at my peers. 
and I see them like wasting their life. I see them not wanting to do nothing with themselves. So like I feel as though if they already looking up to me, why not be the leader and lead by example? Why not make a change? Why not? I had a taste of the bad. I've been in and out of jail since I was 12 years old. I done sold every drug you can think of. I done played with every type of gun. But that's not the life of me because I'm smart. A lot of people wouldn't think that because of these tattoos on my face and all over my body, but I'm very intelligent. I got my GED with a 3.8 grade point average. Like, my undergraduate. Like, I'm from the hood. I'm from the struggle. Like, I come from the struggle, but I ain't gonna let that pull me down either. I told you in the beginning, I'm gonna beat them at their own game. They already counted me out by giving me two felonies. And by me being a young black male, that's a felon to the crimes that I committed. So I'm just gonna beat them at their own game and lead by example. And hopefully, by me leading by example, it'll be others leading by example. All right. Earl? Uh, me personally, I just, I just start looking at life different. Like one day I just woke up and I was like, well, actually I was incarcerated and I'm just thinking like, wow, how did I get here? Like, how did I get here? Like, if you are an adult, you should never have another person tell you what to do. I can't walk in my own refrigerator. You know, I gotta go to sleep when they tell me to go to sleep. It was, it was, it was horrible, man. I don't like that. And I, and I just, when I got out of there, I was just like, you know what? I really didn't know how to change, but I think it was just a blessing that a lot of doors opened for me. You know, I had good people on my side. And, like, some people have to want to change. You know, I always wanted to change. A lot of the things that was happening in my life that I was doing just didn't all, it, it never sat right with me. And, you know, I just, I just said, I'm just going to change. It was just something that happened one day. And I went to um, a lot of, I think, them NA programs and alcohol programs and stuff and was like hearing people's stories. And I was listening to them stories like, wow, and I'm acting crazy out here. You know, I was very ungrateful because it's people who parents had them in the house for days, for days without parents that ain't even 10 years old. You know, it's like a lot of people whose story was way worse than mine. You know, I should be thinking, God, that I'm even here. And, you know, just listening to other people's stories, you know. Um, I just stopped listening to what I wanted to do mm -hmm. in a way. I just let other people tell me what to do. All right. Okay. Like, but not negative people, positive people, definitely. <laughs> sure. um, my change, my change didn't come as much in, you know, my personal life as it did my music. Like, what I changed was the message I gave in my music. When I started rapping, you know, I was rapping about selling drugs and shooting this. With, none of that was my life, none of it at all. And I wasn't getting the approval that I wanted from my family, from my older cousins, from the people that I was looking up to, and I was pretty much rapping for it. I wasn't getting that approval. So I decided to change the message that I was giving in my music. And it was like the best thing I ever done. Like, you know, I sit here here talking about, you know, what's going on in the community because of my music. You know, I'm I'm giving these opportunities. I'm, you know, in history as the first hip hop artist to perform in City Hall. That happened because of the message I decided to portray with my, or give give out with my music. Mm. So my change came understanding the importance of my message and whether it was approval from my family or being on a platform to talk to people, I wouldn't get these opportunities that I got if I didn't make the choice to change what I was doing. All right. I was just wondering in terms of Earl and Rashid, being a father, has that motivated you as well in terms of the change in your life? Yes, definitely. You know, um, looking into my daughter's eyes, it's like, just looking into their eyes, because I had twin daughters and it's like, it definitely changed me, for real, because I don't want no one else raising my children, you know? <laughs> I, I gotta be here for them, like, and also my father not really being around in my life. He was definitely there, but he never really gave me that, that he never, how, how can I put it? Father thing. Yeah, he never gave me no father thing. He, he never really set boundaries for me, you know? He came around, he did, he gave me money and everything, but then he left. So he never really schooled me to how to be a man. And not having my father hurt, like if you calling a person and then they saying they gonna come this day, and then three weeks then pass by, he was supposed to got me this weekend, mm. then he come back in three weekends, 
three weekends later with the Jordans and everything. Yeah, that was fine, mm -hmm. but forget the materialistic items. I wanted to spend time with my father, so I never let my children feel how I felt. Like, I want to break the cycle. Just to piggyback on what he said, like, looking at my kid, like, both of them, like, just looking at him, like, no, I can't. I don't want another never man raising my child unless I'm deceased. And I feel as though I ain't gonna be deceased for a while because God, he blessing me every day. So like, just looking at my, my, looking at my son eyes because I'm a father now, I'm not a dad. Because any man can say they're a dad. Yeah. But it take a real man to be a father. I was taught that. Yeah. And like, I do for my son like I would do for any other, like any other sibling. Like I take care of my son like, it's just like, it was the greatest feeling ever because now I get to show my dad, cause he's a dad, how to be a father by me being with my son every day. Even when I'm at work and I know I shouldn't have him at work, I have my son at work. When I'm in the studio recording my songs, I'm singing with my son in my arms and he holding the microphone while I'm singing with him. Like, so just like that father-son bond, nobody can ever take that away from me. So it made me want to change because I don't want my son following the same footsteps I followed behind like doing what my dad did, and now he doing what his dad did. So I want him to follow the positive footsteps. Or my dad was a motivational speaker, or my dad sung at this concert, or my dad danced at this concert, or he did this for this person. I want to do the positive things my dad did, not the wrong. So, you know. So what I want to do now, I want to ask each of our four young panelists, if you had words that you wanted to share with the village, about this issue and about how we how we do it. If you, if you knew then what you what you know now, what? Be who you can be. If you a young lady or a young if you a young lady who can do hair, if you're a young male who like playing with computers, if you like even just shooting a basketball around or you like cleaning toilets or fish bowls, anything you like doing, do it. Your, a real friend is gonna motivate you to do that positive thing before he mo motivates you to do that negative thing. If he motivating you to do something negative, he or she, you don't need to be around that person because they don't really care about your future like my man Earl said. And this is my homie then, just to let y'all know, and we ain't even from the same hood. But that connection and that bond that we getting from each other just by sitting on this stage, yeah. like, it ain't, like, you shouldn't be ashamed to shake another person's hand or smile and, and, and appreciate somebody or just say, you know what I mean, give them congratulations or something for them doing something positive. You shouldn't have no pride on doing that, so, like, that's right. what it is. Thank you, my brother. All right, <laughs> oh, let's get a man a hand. <laughs> if you knew then what you know now, what? Well, I would just, first of all, I would tell a young person, or myself, or another young man. Another, whomever. All right, whomever. I would definitely tell them, you know, follow your dreams, you know? A lot of people, they would say certain things to you like, failure is not an option. You know, that's how I look at it. Failure is definitely not an option. You should follow. If you believe you could do something, you could do it. You know, I know a lot of people that have been through, have been through some things, and they're here. They, they're living a good life. You know, they're taking care of their kids. They're here for their loved ones. I would just basically tell them, if, if don't nobody love them, I love them. You know, and right. just... You gotta love yourself also, because That's if right. you don't love yourself, then you, you can't do anything in life. All right. I would say, so far, I, don't, I wasn't in none of the situations that they was in. I was actually the victim <laughs> of, some, of violence. So I would say like, don't, it don't matter who you are, how you are, how you respect yourself. No matter how much good you do, how much bad you do, something can always happen to you. You should always expect the unexpected. Hmm. Oh yeah, um, I will also tell these kids out here, stop bullying, you know, because the bullying is like, me personally, in a way I was a bully and I can't go certain places without a hat to conceal my identity and that's not a good way to live, like live life. You know, you should be comfortable. You shouldn't have to look over your shoulders and worried about if you're going to see somebody you did something bad to in the past. Right. So that bullying stuff, cut it out right now. Nip it in the bud. That's right. All right. Um, if I could say anything to the youth, it would just be to be a leader. You know, 
is is super cliche. Don't be a follower, be a leader. But that's real. Like be a leader and take pride in the influence that you have over people and lead them in towards positive things. All right, let's give everybody a hand for our We Love Our Children <laughs> town hall meeting. And now I want to ask Pennsylvania Secretary of Corrections, Mr. John Wurzel, to come and give us closing remarks. And I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for being here and to the WRD 900 AM listening family. Uh, we, we have work to do in the name of loving our children. Thank you. Well, first of all, how about another round for these folks? What a What a powerful hour and a half. And if you weren't impacted by the past hour and a half, you weren't paying attention. Uh, that was just remarkable. And I came here to hear about youth violence, but what I really heard about is youth resilience. And more importantly, youth resilience that led to youth achievement. And I think that we really need to focus on that. And I'll share a story with you. I spent a little time with a young brother at Graterford a couple weeks ago. And he told me, he said, you know, I'm a different person today than the person who came in this prison. But he said, but Secretary, tell you the truth, I don't think anybody will ever see that different person. And I said to him the same thing that I heard from these folks here. I said, it starts with you. And if you define yourself by what happened to you, then everyone else will always define you. You can't control how they define you, but you can control how you define you. And that's what these young brothers and sisters did. Because we're all a byproduct of, of what happens to us and our circumstances. But what that looks like, whether we're better for it or worse for it, is how, what we control. And I'll, I'll borrow a quote that I read in the New York Times. And the quote said that we sit at the crossroads between human tragedy and human opportunity. And when you look at our children of no fault of their own, they see human tragedy every day. And the actions or the inactions of us will dictate their opportunity at the back end. So I hope that we all take this challenge that we need action. And we need to lead, and it needs to start today. These folks gave us the lesson that, that we should all take from here. Every one of us, and us together, are six inches away from greatness. That's the good news. The bad news in some cases is that six inches is the six inches between our ears. And if we don't educate ourselves, and we don't believe in ourselves, and believe that we can be whatever we want to be if we take that walk together. So I want to thank you for sending that message to us in, in more eloquent words. And how about, a, how about a real round of applause for these folks? They said we couldn't do this in 90 minutes. Well, this is just the beginning. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to this wonderful panel. One thing that I want to say is the thing in assembling this panel, and I'm sorry that Nashe was not here, but she was, she was on her way, so I don't know what happened. But everyone that I talked to about being on this panel was so passionate about wanting to tell their stories. And so there is so much wisdom that we can gain as adults by listening and opening our, our minds and our hearts to listening to what they have to say about their experience. And so I wanna again commend you and thank you and I wanna thank Marla and Dr. Chuck and Joel Fine and all of the folks at CHOP for helping us to put this all together because this is an issue that we have to embrace and it's all about us as a collective. And as Brother Shamari, said we are committed at WURD to continue this conversation on our airwaves, in the community, online, every way that we can to continue this dialogue. So um, thank you very much for our sponsors, for our partners, for Universal, for Always Best Care,
for Eric Grimes, Brother Shamari, for navigating us through this conversation. And I want to also thank the staff at WURD because they put so much time and care and love and attention into creating these